And uh, for us left behind, little rapture joke there in case you... <laughs> Please get your Bible and uh, turn with me to the Gospel according to Mark. Gospel according to Mark. And today we are in chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, 20 and ending in verse 35. Chapter 3, verse 20. Hear with me the word of the Lord. Then he, Jesus Christ, our Lord, went home. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he, called them to, and he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside. They are seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you for your word. It is true and it's perfect. It's without error or falsehood and it's living and active. And by your word, you save to the uttermost. And by your word, you bring hope and encouragement. And by your word, you bring correction and rebuke and training in righteousness. We love your word. We know that you work powerfully by your word to save and to sanctify for the praise of your glory. And we ask that now that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us ears to hear and a mind to understand, a heart to receive what you have to say to us this morning. We are here not to hear the opinion of a man, but we're here to hear your word. So Lord, speak, for your servants are listening. In Christ's name we ask, amen. I find that one of the most striking features of the Gospel of Mark is the uh, repeated opposition we see to the Lord Jesus Christ by demons and by Satan himself. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 13, we saw that immediately after Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness where Satan tempted him. That's how our Lord's three-year ministry on earth began. It was, he was attacked by Satan. But, of course, he held his ground triumphantly, and he did not sin. Then in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we saw our Lord confronted repeatedly by a demon or a number of demons who had taken possession of a human being. When the demons saw the Lord, they, remember, he, they correctly and they audibly identified who he was. But the Lord Jesus commanded them to be silent and come out of them. And in every case, the, the demons obeyed. On at least one occasion, they even fell down before Jesus, submitting unwillingly to his authority. Then in chapter 3, verse 15, we saw the Lord Jesus send out his apostles, giving them authority 
to cast out demons. I'm not sure what your theology is of demons and Satan, but if we truly believe that the Bible is the word of God and that the Bible is therefore true, free from error and falsehood, then we must believe and take seriously the fact that there are demons led by Satan who are at work in this world in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ and his mission. The way the Bible describes Satan and his work is, I find, quite alarming. If indeed we believe the Bible is true. For example, in 1 John 5, we're told that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In 2 Corinthians 4, we're told that Satan is the god of this world who has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. In Ephesians 2, we're told that before you and I were saved, we were, like all unbelievers, following the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan. In 1 Peter 5, we're told that the devil is our enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Elsewhere in the Bible, we're told that Satan is a proud rebel, the serpent, the father of lies, a murderer, and an accuser of the saints. And it was in the context of this spiritual darkness that the Lord Jesus Christ began his ministry. And that ministry was focused squarely on defeating the devil and rescuing a multitude of people from every nation from his grip. The devil's powerful. Make no mistake about it. But as we've already begun to see in the Gospel of Mark, the devil is no match for the Lord Jesus Christ. On May 2nd, 2020, there's a man, I believe he lives in Iceland, who is nearly seven feet tall, and he weighs roughly 450 pounds, and most of it's muscle. And he set the world record in deadlifting on May 2nd of last year. He lifted 501 kilograms. I'm not sure if Richard can, <laughs> can do that much yet. <laughs> I think that's the world record, 501 kilograms. And that would make him, in the deadlifting category, the strongest man in the world. Well, by analogy, if we say that the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ is like the strength of that weightlifter, then the strength of Satan, in comparison, would be comparable to an ant darting across the floor in fear under the strongest man. <laughs> Actually, this analogy is a little inaccurate, a little misleading, because the Lord Jesus Christ, being God, possesses all power, whereas Satan, being a mere creature, possesses limited power, and even that power has been given to him by God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the strongest one who came to bruise the head of Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to disarm the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame on the cross. The Lord came to enter into Satan's house to bind him and then plunder his house. The Lord Jesus came to set captives free from Satan's rule and power. The Lord came to call and deliver a multitude of people from the domain of Satan and transfer them into his kingdom. The Lord Jesus came to rescue people from the darkness marked by lies and hatred and despair and death. And he came to bring them into the light marked by truth and love and joy and life. Every single person is either following Satan or the Lord Jesus Christ. Or to put it another way, every single person is either against the Lord Jesus Christ and his rescue operation, or for the Lord Jesus Christ and his rescue operation. There is really no middle ground, biblically. There is no fence on, on which any person can sit. 
These are really the only two options. And this really is the force of our passage this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ is the strongest one who came to bind Satan, the strong man, and to set his captives free. The question really for each of us is, are you on board with this mission of Jesus or are you opposed to it? This sermon has four points. The first is this, the charge of Jesus' family. Our passage, if you look at the beginning of it, begins with a group of people, namely Jesus' own family, opposed to him and opposed to his mission. And that opposition is revealed in the false charge that they have against Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 20, where Mark writes this. Then he, Jesus, went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Notice a couple of things here. First, notice who is charging Jesus with being out of his mind. The ESV translation says it's his family. This is probably the best translation of the Greek because later down in verses 31 and 35, or 31 to 35, Mark returns to this same group and there he identifies them as Jesus' Jesus's own mother and his brothers, those who know him well as a son and as a brother. Second, notice the charge that Jesus' own family brings against him. They charge him with being out of his mind. What blasphemy this is for people to judge and charge God the Son with insanity. What blasphemy. Besides, nothing could be further from the truth, right? The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth, and he knows all the truth. He walks in the truth and speaks only what is true. But it's not difficult for us to understand how they arrive at this mistaken assessment of Jesus' mental condition. His family knows him as their son and as a brother. His family knew him as a baby. And they knew him as a carpenter. They knew him as a virtual nobody (laughs) who grew up in the obscure and the insignificant town of Nazareth. And now virtually overnight, he's become an itinerant preacher of the good news about himself. He's going around casting out demons and healing diseased people and certain religious leaders from Jerusalem want him dead. And he's drawing massive crowds, so much so that in verse 20, he can't even take proper care of himself by eating. So quite naturally then, his family concludes their son and brother has lost his mind. So what do they do in verse 21? Or what do they try to do? They try to seize him. The word seize can be translated as to take custody or to take charge or to restrain. In other words, they set out to bind the Lord Jesus Christ. They are determined to grab hold of Jesus and lead him back home and return him to his senses. And in doing this, they set themselves up against Jesus and against his mission. Now this brings us to this sermon's second point, which is this, the charge of the scribes. Next in our passage, we meet a second group of people opposed to Christ and his mission. Look at verse 22. Mark writes, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. So notice a couple things here. First, notice who is opposing the Lord Jesus Christ. Scribes. These are highly respected religious experts in the Torah, the religious, the Jewish scriptures. The scribes are so highly esteemed that their interpretation of the Jewish scriptures is normally understood to be unquestionable and binding. Scribes are also teachers of the Torah, and they are legal jurists like our own civil lawyers. Not surprisingly, then, many of them are members of the Sanhedrin, the highest court of the Jews in their day. 
These are the delegates then who seem to have been sent by the Jewish religious leadership to accuse the Lord Jesus Christ publicly. Second, observe the charge they bring against the Lord. Actually, there are two closely related charges they level against him. First, they accuse him of being possessed by Beelzebul. Beelzebul is another name for Satan, which the rest of verse 22 makes clear. But scholars disagree exactly what the name means or where it came from. Probably it means Baal the prince or Baal's abode or dynasty. Um, if you know your Old Testament, Baal was the supreme god of the Canaanites. And whatever power that false god presumably had was given to him by Satan. So essentially the scribes are charging the Lord Jesus Christ of being controlled or bound by Satan. But they bring a second charge against him at the end of verse 22. They accuse him of casting out demons by the means of Satan, the prince of demons. And strikingly, actually, they don't deny that Jesus has been casting out demons. Rather, what they do deny is that he's doing so by the power of God. Instead, they charge him with casting out demons by the power of of Satan. So Jesus is confronted by two groups who, although they are remarkably different, nevertheless, they are surprisingly the same and that they both oppose him and his mission. They both utter blasphemy against him and they both claim that either Jesus must be bound because he's lost his marbles or he is already bound by the devil himself. But now it's our Lord's turn to speak. This brings us to our third point, which is this. The response of Jesus to the scribes. Look at verse 23. To the charge of the scribes that he casts out demons by means of the power of Satan, Jesus replies, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. What is Jesus doing in this first part of his reply to the scribes? He's using a series of parables to get them to think about their charge. He's using logical analogies so that they might see that their charge, that he is casting out demons by Satan, is illogical. Doesn't make sense. In verse 24, Jesus uses the parable then, first, of a divided kingdom. If a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand, it cannot survive. You'll remember that after the fall of King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel broke out into civil war. And that kingdom could not stand. In fact, it became divided, right? Into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Likewise, if Satan is warring, waging war against his own demons, then Satan's kingdom cannot stand or survive. In verse 25, Jesus puts it another way by using another parable. Consider a house. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. This is easy enough to understand. When a husband rages against his wife as if she is his enemy, then his household will fall apart. Likewise, if Satan is raging against his own demons, using Jesus to cast them out of people, then his household cannot stand. As Jesus makes plain in verse 26, Satan's household is then coming to an end. In other words, Jesus is showing to the scribes and to us, that it's irrational to say he's casting out demons by Satan because then Satan would be fighting against Satan, undoing his very own work. Now then, in verse 27, what the Lord Jesus Christ does next is he explains what's really going on when he casts out demons. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, Unless he first binds the strong man, then 
indeed, he may plunder his house. So the scribes are saying that Jesus was bound or tied up by Satan. That's how he was presumably casting out demons. But now Jesus tells them the truth. He has bound or tied up Satan. I love how one commentator explains this. He writes this, quote, The kingdom of Satan is not self-destructing from within, but is being invaded from without. Close quote. Consider the parable in verse 27. The Lord Jesus Christ has entered into this dark world, which is the house of Satan, the strong man. And the Lord Jesus Christ, being infinitely stronger, has bound Satan in his own house, as if tying a man to his chair in his own house with his arms behind his back. Therefore, the Lord is now able to plunder Satan's goods. And you know what those goods are? People. People. People possessed and controlled and blinded by Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ came to bind Satan and set a multitude of his prisoners free to be with himself, to know and love and serve and worship the only true God forever. That includes us. Now, the Lord is not done yet responding to the accusation of of the scribes, is he? Now he will speak more specifically to their charge that he's possessed by Beelzebul. Look at verse 28. The Lord Jesus says, Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So beginning in verse 28, the Lord says, truly, or literally, amen. God the Son says, amen. He says this to underscore that the words he's about to speak are his very own words, and therefore absolutely true and trustworthy. Jesus has a solemn, weighty warning to give in verse 29. But first, in verse 28, there's an encouraging word. It's almost eclipsed by the alarming nature of the warning, but we must not miss the encouraging word. In verse 28, here's the good news of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. God in heaven is able, willing, ready to forgive you and me of all of our sin. That is all of our rebellion against him, all of our hatred, all of our lies, all of our immorality, all of our evil actions, all of it. According to verse 28, God is even able, he's willing, he's ready to forgive us of whatever blasphemies you and I have spoken. He's willing and able to forgive whatever words we have spoken against him that have dishonored him. Blasphemy includes calling God evil or unjust or unfair or a liar or insane. Blasphemy includes using God's name in vain. To all of these sins, the holy God of the Bible responds with righteous anger and furious indignation. So then how can God, who is the just judge, forgive such horrific evils, all of them? The answer is that the Lord Jesus Christ entered into this world and he lived a sinless life, was nailed to the cross upon which he bore the wrath of God, which you deserve for your sin, and took the punishment of death you had earned and on the third day rose from the dead. Now all who turn away from living a life devoted to sin and who rest their full weight upon Jesus Christ alone, the Lord and only Savior, will be rescued from the tyranny of Satan, forgiven of all their sin, and brought back to God.
Now in verse 29, Jesus also gives a solemn warning. Jesus says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. When I was a young, fairly young believer, one day I mentioned to a friend that I knew what the unforgivable sin was. And he responded by quickly insisting that I not tell him lest he commit that sin. I think that in his mind, if I had told him what the unforgivable sin is, that would be equivalent equivalent to the, the foolishness of telling a child not to touch a hot stove. Because what happens if you tell a child not to touch a hot stove? Well, he's going to touch the hot stove. Well, I didn't buy that argument, so I began to tell him what the unforgivable sin is. <laughs> but he put his fingers in his ears and belted out his favorite song to tune me out. <laughs> Friends, let me assure you that if you're a Christian, you're never, ever going to be at risk of committing the unforgivable sin. So knowing about it cannot harm you. Now, I think that the only way I can convince you of this is by showing you in the text what the unforgivable sin is. So what is it? The key to understanding this correctly is found in verse 30. After our Lord is done speaking, Mark, the author of this gospel, adds an editorial explanation. He writes, For they, that is the scribes, were saying, He, Jesus, has an unclean spirit. In other words, the scribes are saying Jesus was possessed by Satan and Jesus was casting out demons by the power of Satan. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ had in mind in verse 29. What the scribes were doing when they said that Jesus was casting out demons by the power of Satan was blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. This is because the Lord Jesus was casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. The scribes blasphemed, to put it another way, the scribes blasphemed when they saw the miraculous saving work of God the Son freeing people from the tyranny and oppression of, and control of the devil by the power of the Holy Spirit. They looked at that miraculous work, the scribes, and they said, that's the work of Satan. That's blasphemy. This is the only sin that is unforgivable because as long as you call the work of Christ evil or satanic, you will not turn to Christ and trust in him for salvation. That's why it's unforgivable. As the end of verse 29 says, this sin is eternal in the sense that if you die believing this, the consequence of your unbelief will be eternal. You will spend all of eternity away from the presence of the Lord. Pretty heavy stuff. Let's move to our fourth, final point, which I'm calling the response of Jesus to his family. We see this in verses 31 to 35. You'll remember from verses 20 and 21 that Jesus' family thinks he's out of his mind. So they decide to go out to seize him. Well, now our Lord responds to them. Look with me at verse 31. Mark writes, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your, your mother and your brothers, are, they're outside, and they're seeking you. So we see here that just as he was back in verses 20 and 21, Jesus is still inside a house with his apostles and a crowd sitting around him. But his family is still outside, still seeking him that they might seize him. But they they can't get inside the house to him because of the crowd. So what do they do? They send a message to him. Maybe this like playing telephone. The message gets through the crowd and finally reaches him. And now Jesus responds in verse 33. And he answered them, that is the crowd, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are, my bro- mother. Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And what our Lord is doing here is 
defining who his spiritual family is. We should be surprised by who is excluded from his spiritual family. In this scene, they are literally outside the house. Excluded, at least at this point, are those who seem to be closest to Jesus. That is, his own mother and half-brothers. Sure, they know a great deal about Jesus. They spent a lot of time with him. But the reason they're not yet saved and the reason they're not yet included in, their, in his spiritual family is they're trying to bind him. They're trying to control him because they think he's out of his mind. You see, his agenda is not yet their agenda. His mission is not yet their mission. So his own family, they stand opposed to his rescue operation. Just like the scribes who are saying he's possessed by the devil. Such a sobering warning. Because down through the centuries, people have made the deadly mistake of thinking they were members of the spiritual family of Christ when they were not. They thought they were inside of Jesus' house, so to speak, just because they had parents who were Christians or just because they grew up in the church or just because they knew lots about Jesus or just because they spent lots of time reading the scriptures. Yet all the while they were on the outside because, like Jesus' family in this passage, they did not truly trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. They weren't really on board with his mission to seek and to save the lost, and to build up his church. They didn't see any need to believe the gospel and share the gospel. Instead, just like Jesus' family, they tried to control and manipulate Jesus. They tried to get him to do what they wanted him to do, to achieve their own agenda, their own mission, their own personal goals in this world, as if he were a genie of some kind, out of the bottle, subject to them. Who are the true spiritual family of the Lord Jesus Christ? Look at verse 35. Included are those who are inside the house. Included in Jesus' spiritual family are those who do the will of God. In other words, included are those who are not trying to control the Lord Jesus Christ, but rather who are seeking to be controlled by him. Included in Jesus' spiritual family are those who are seeking to live their lives in humble submission to the Lord. Included are those who in the very first place have been broken over their own sin and have obeyed the Lord Jesus' command to repent and believe his gospel. Included in his family are those whom the Lord Jesus has delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into his kingdom of light. Included are those who are on board with our Lord's mission to bruise the head of the serpent, to set the captives free, and build up God's spiritual family, which is the church. That's who is in Jesus' spiritual family. Let's pray. God, your word is awesome. Your gospel, incredible. Lord, who are we that you would set your love on us and rescue us and deliver us out of the domain of Satan and darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of your beloved son? Thank you, God, for rescuing us, for saving us, for setting us free, taking us out of the the tyrannical grip of the evil one and bringing us to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How good it is to be in his house. How good it is to be under his lordship. How good it is to be under his rule and his reign forevermore. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your grace to us. So many, maybe in our extended families or in this community, who are still bound by evil, and by Satan. God, we, we know their names. Maybe even see their faces. 
We think of our neighbors. Lord, make us faithful and make us bold to share the only gospel message to them by which they can be saved, delivered, rescued, set free, to know you and enjoy you and worship you forever. God, advance your gospel, especially in this day. So many are afraid, trapped, living in despair. Set more of your captives, these captives free. For the praise of your glory, we ask, build your church and show us how you want us to be part of that. In Christ's name we ask, amen.